Welcome to Our College, Your Voices. I'm your host, Kara Monroe. This week, we have two episodes for you. These episodes are the first of our series of conversations with colleagues from around the state about the book, So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluo. We'll be bringing you the conversations mostly in their entirety, editing only for flow and where participants requested that something not be placed in the public conversation. I want to thank everyone who participated in these conversations. These talks are hard, but we must have them if we're going to dismantle systemic racism in our country and in our college. I invite you to think through these conversations with us. And if you find yourself uncomfortable, I encourage you to sit with the discomfort. Don't walk away from it. If we're going to make change, we all have to get a little uncomfortable. I'm going to start on page six, where she's talking about the fact that we're going to have conversations about race. And she says, but no matter how daunting, you are here because you want to hear and you want to be heard. You are here because you know that something is very wrong and you want to change. We can find our way to each other. We can find a way to our truths. I have seen it happen. My life is a testament to it. And it all starts with conversation. And I thought that was sort of a perfect way to start the conversation today. So please jump in and let's just talk about what what you found meaningful in the introduction. Well, okay. So I was drawn by, I'm trying to find exactly where it was, but where she talked about the melting pot utopia, Mm -hmm. I kind of liked that, that, you know, we're not really, this is sort of a false metaphor that we're really not just this melting pot. We're still like it from that, you know, individual, instead of all melting together and becoming the same, we're still individual ingredients that try instead to, you know, touch one another and be equal to one another in that pot. So Instead of a melting pot, I guess it's more like um, vegetable soup, you know, where you can see all the different vegetables. On page four, I really I marked where she mentions that, you know, I had started to see myself. And once you start to see yourself, you can't pretend anymore. And so I think it's kind of why it's important to talk about this sort of stuff, because as soon as you start naming it and and, you know, that's how you can actually start addressing those things. And it's it's really hard to be self-deceptive if, if, you know, you're confronting those things. So. That was, that spoke to me. She talks a lot in the chapter and in, in the chapter and in the book in total about trying to have had these conversations in the past where they've gone badly. And I wonder, you know, as I've certainly lived that and I, I don't, I guess I want to use this experience as a way to try to get stronger because they're still going to go badly when you have them. And so I, I don't know, that spoke to me a lot in this section. Kara, I think I agree with you that, you know, that's always one of my concerns is in having these conversations, I'm going to mess up. But in the book, she kind of talked a little bit about, let's do what we can to try to limit how much we mess up, because we know we're going to, but, you know, using those opportunities to get better and be better informed for the next time we have those conversations too. I definitely think these conversations are very difficult to have. And I've taught like a diversity course at Purdue. And it's very hard, I think, for students to kind of wrestle that there is inequity in our society and that we all have some sort of privilege somehow. And it makes us feel really guilty having these conversations. And I think that's what makes these conversations so hard is knowing that there's inequity and something's happening, but we don't want it to be that way. So I think it's just hard all around and kind of acknowledging that and pushing past that's really important for us, like to model for students too, is what it was making me think about. With some of these conversations, uh, she's trying to have so many conversations with so many different people, but she feels as though she's just not being heard and not being uh, understood. And I kind of see uh, the quote as a, as a reflection on the importance of listening rather than trying to frame our expectations from where other people may be coming from, what can we do as listeners to be more empathetic and to have space? Because we all want to be heard and we all want to be understood. And that frustration of trying to tell one story, but never really having that connection and the emphasis of, of listening within the conversations as, as part of that equation. That kind of touches on, I think for me, what was striking was how often she talked about being tired uh, and being exhausted. And I think sometimes just the willingness to engage in these conversations, we have to be willing to push back and push 
push through that, but to have the lived experience of, of feeling tired and feeling constantly on the defense, I, I think really was striking to me that it's kind of a daily thing. As we think about that for our, I I love that line of conversation, as we think about that for our faculty and staff colleagues of color and our students of color, how do we create places and spaces where they can rest and they don't have to feel exhausted and threatened all the time? I've thought a lot about that as I've read the book. I don't have a solution yet, but I acknowledge it's something that we need to make time and space for. I found that whole angle of exhaustion really helpful because I've heard people talk about being exhausted, but personally, uh, I feel excited about the time that we're in. I feel like, you know, we could be making one of those huge paradigm shifts and that's really exciting. But then reading all of the material on privilege made me realize the reason I'm not exhausted is because of all my privilege. I'm coming to some of this material for the very first time. And so, it makes me want, it, I'm glad to understand exhaustion now, and it makes me want to be really sensitive to that. This summer, I'm teaching a class called Media and the Law. And so, obviously, uh, there are lots of examples uh, at work in the media right now of inequities. And so, I started the class this semester by saying, you know, usually, this class is primarily based on participation. But if you don't feel like talking about this right now, that's okay. If this is all you're talking about outside of class and you don't want to do this topic this summer, we don't have to do this topic this summer. So I gave them a little survey to do at the beginning of class and they were all anxious to talk. And I have students in that class that are in their 60s, and I have students in that class that are very shortly out of high school, and the amount of respect that they have shown for each other with different sets of opinions has been really remarkable. I know that that's probably not always what happens in a classroom, but it's been really wonderful this summer. I love that you you gave them that choice. You gave them that agency, Lara, and that's so, that's so good to give folks that space to make that choice for themselves. I love that. That is interesting, Laura. I usually, when we have topics of equality, inequality, race come up in class, which is pretty frequent, I find our discussions have always been civil in my classes. People will will say things that uh, frustrate others and so forth, but they're civil. But I end up worrying about the students who seem to withdraw, who are um, often feel like they don't feel free to share their views. Uh, and and that troubles me when I'm going in with a group of students to try and get a sense of how to make them feel more comfortable sharing views that they think their their classmates or their teacher may not appreciate. Do you put that, anything about it in the syllabus? Well, well, I have a statement of civility in class, civility, but it's it's not so much. And and I do frequently on first day because it's politics class. We talk about the fact that you know we want a diversity of, of opinions. You know, we talk about John Stuart Mill and the importance of having a diversity of opinions. So it is a ground rule in the class. But I still feel that you know, and I've had students who come up to me and say they just feel like if they say what they really think, their classmates are going to get angry with them. I think that goes along. I have the paperback. So on page six, where she says, people find me online messaging platforms and beg me not to make their questions public. People create whole new email accounts. They can email me anonymously. People are afraid of getting these conversations wrong, but they are still trying. And I deeply appreciate that. So I think that space to share for some may need to start as an anonymous setting just so that they can get comfortable with these topics. I know with me, I felt like ever since the the Black Lives Matter movement and um, with George Floyd picking up the momentum and that I feel even more so that I have a responsibility as a white woman to make sure that it's known that I'm trying my hardest to be an ally. I still have a lot of work to do, I'm sure. And there's probably a lot of privilege that I'm unaware of and maybe, you know, and some implicit bias but I feel even more of a responsibility to say something 
if if something is said, let's say during Thanksgiving or some other just random daily conversations where someone might slide something in and and it's to me I feel like I need to say wait you know what I don't that's not okay I'm not going to listen to that and that's wrong so I feel this book is also opening my eyes to all the privilege that I have which is good and I'm definitely going to say something and speak up because um, it does need to, to stop. I think to build on that a little bit, Megan, something that really resounded with me just specifically in the introduction is when she's talking about how her white friends don't want to have that conversation. It's a difficult conversation. Is it really their responsibility? And I attended a national student leadership and diversity conference in New York a few years ago. And I remember having that fire. I, I, I attended a breakout session called um, something along the lines of white privilege and what to do once you recognize it. And I remember, you know, at the end of that session, I was like, okay, now that I know, what do I do? And I had this conviction to do something about it. And reading through this book made me realize that I'm back to feeling uncomfortable about having these conversations. And I've let myself slide on that. So I'm beginning to feel that conviction again that, you know, not only do I need to pick some of this back up, but I need to maintain it and looking at my own self and how do I maintain that conversation? How do I maintain those changes, make them become a habit and make them come just something that I do unconsciously instead of having to really think about what I'm doing consciously on an everyday basis. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing from the introduction that I kind of took away is, is reigniting that fire and realizing that I I can't let it slide. None of us can let it slide. If there's going to be change, if we're going to see that paradigm shift, it, it has to be something that we live every day. Such a great counterpoint, Terry, to the conversation on exhaustion, that when we do get exhausted, we need to take a little rest, but then we've got to get right back in the fight. And that's such a good, such a good reminder for all of us. Anything else on the introduction? Oh, sorry, Imani, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think like us uh, taking that burden for other people um, who might be more marginalized than ourselves is helping alleviate some of that exhaustion they're feeling. So I think even though we might feel exhausted, it's helping other people who are more marginalized. And that's just only a little bit of what they're feeling. So I think it's good to help us like reframe that. Absolutely. And just to piggyback off that sense of community. Like what we're doing here to kind of talk about uh, rather than just one person feeling like they're trying to do everything themselves to realize there's a larger network and community uh, of people asking us similar questions. I think uh, one main uh, thing, we've all kind of been around the same section of the introduction. Directly speaking, I think it's vital if you're going to approach something like this in a classroom or as a, even as a you know, a small group of you know, your colleagues, uh, establishing a very clear vocabulary, making sure there's a clear understanding and agreement of these these terms. What is Black Lives Matter? What is intersectionality? What does white privilege mean? And I think what I predict, what would happen is at the beginning, you would have a whole lot of different definitions that do not align with one another. And the goal maybe, of, an early goal should be uh, unifying those before you can try to advance beyond that. So I think that's a great point that Steve makes. And I'm, I'm reflecting on, frankly, I have um, in-laws that are pretty racist people. And I'm reflecting on conversations we've had regarding the terms Black Lives Matter. You know, and then instinctively, all lives matter, white lives matter comes from them after that. And so I guess my point to Steve is, I'm not sure you're ever going to get a unified agreement of what that Black Lives Matter means, or more than that, maybe what it means, but an acceptance of the value of it, you know, because some of those concepts are value driven. Black Lives Matter is really an argument about recognizing a lack of privilege and recognizing a lack of value, recognizing a systemic problem. I suppose that's a good point. Yeah. So, and if if I'm wrong, I'm looking for it because I've I've just quit talking to them. <laughs> no, that's that's and that's I think that's the temptation we all have is you know you just shrug like okay you you don't get it you refuse to understand and you but I I, I think that may unfortunately perpetuate the problem is right. Uh, if you 
you know, we all are here because we are passionate about making changes. And I think with that passion has to come this, you know, a sort of undying dedication to just keep, keep at it, keep hammering it away, you know, as best you can and as positively as you can. It's very easy to just, you know, react, knee jerk react to in the same way they are, but that doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. uh, That, I think we all probably have relatives that we think about this conversation with or friends or someone else. And that the, the words black lives matter, they do ignite a lot of passion. And, you know, my response to it when it's somebody that I think is open to the conversation is actually from, if you follow me on Facebook, you know, I'm a big Peloton writer and the, there's a phrase in from one of the Peloton coaches. She says, if black lives don't matter, all lives can't matter. And I I really appreciate that perspective that we have to, that's a way to recognize the marginalization. But my other thought is, and I haven't had the courage to do it yet, but maybe this conversation will do that, is to ask why. Why does that phrase bother you? Why does it upset you? And try to go at it in that way. Again, that could result in utter failure. I don't know, but that might be what I try the next time. It's a good, good I have question. A I haven't tried the why. I've just tried the, listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my favorite method too, Rebecca. <laughs> I have a distant uncle who told me that if I thought Black Lives Matter was not a hate group, that I'm uneducated on the topic. And his education consists of seeing other Facebook posts from his friends. So mm-hmm. I just, in, in that situation, I like write, you know, three paragraphs, four paragraphs, and then then I just delete it all. Like, you know what? I'm not even going to, it's not worth my time right now. Right. I think that's an interesting sort of element to all this is how, and maybe some of the problems that we're facing as, uh, you know, uh, people who associate with students directly in a classroom or, you know, in, in other venues, we, unlike Facebook, where you can basically curate your friends list to your liking and not look at what you don't want to look at. We have to maybe reconfigure and be back, go back to being human and and being understand that people are going to have different opinions and you can't shut them down. You have to be able to be a listener in order to be a, a contributor. Right. I think a lot of people would automatically just delete people like that. And it's easier to do when they're friends and not family but I've really tried hard not to delete anyone because there are times when I see posts that I really want to shed a little light into. I'm like, let me just write something very politely on this one, you know, and see if it goes anywhere. If they want to delete me, that's fine. But I feel like deleting everyone that is like that isn't really, in my opinion, you know, for me, like helping, I guess. I think, Steve, that you make a great point about curating your reality on Facebook. I'm I guess I have, I'm going to just confess this. It makes me feel better. I blocked my mother-in-law, but anyway, (laughs) my point was though, that I think about that, about my mother-in-law and I realize that she doesn't benefit from what we benefit from here at Ivy tech, which was, we have a pretty diverse community. You know, when we teach, we teach with a diversity group, group of students. We have a diverse community we work with every day. My mother-in-law, zero diversity in her life. You know, especially now that she's in her 80s and she's living alone and there's zero diversity. So I don't know that she'll ever really cross the bridge to understanding at least the, the concept of systemic privilege. I don't, I don't think she'll ever get that. So I did eventually unblock her, but first day I was mad. <laughs> Becky, I will admit that I, I've kind of done the same thing with my uncle, too. Um, trying to not close off that line of communication online. And, you know, if it's, if I'm blocking somebody that automatically, you know, limits how much exposure they're going to get to other viewpoints, but, you know, even if it's just unfollowing them for a little while, so that way I'm not inundated with their sometimes hateful sort of rhetoric, Right. it still gives them the off chance that they'll see what I'm posting and then they will, you know, be able to engage in a conversation that, Mm-hmm. we might be able to find some common points on. Harry mentioned that if black lives don't matter, then all lives can't matter. And it kind of sparked something that a friend of mine posted on Facebook where she had mentioned all lives do matter. Just right now, black lives need to matter just a little bit more. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's another thing that kind of sits and stirs in my brain. 
So let's broaden our conversation out to add in chapter one. You can always certainly bring points back from the introduction. So chapter one is, is it really about race? And I'm going to actually start this chapter with a question that's from the sort of official discussion guide for the book. In chapter one, is it really about race? The author states, it is about race if a person of color thinks it is about race. It is about race if it disproportionately or differently affects people of color. It is about race if it fits into a broader pattern of events that disproportionately or differently affect people of color. So after reading and and thinking about the author's explanation, can you think of social or political issues that many people currently believe are not about race that actually might be? And which of the guidelines that she lists for understanding when it's about race fit those issues? I would have to say that the pipeline from high school to the prison system, that one just really tugs at my heartstrings right there. You know, with 25, what is it? We are 25% of the world population, but have the highest prison population. Mm-hmm. And then that consists of basically black men and how that changes the families. And I would So if someone were to say that's about race, I would 100% agree. And I'm falling back on if someone of color says it's about race, I'm putting my arms up in the air and I'm going to agree at this. That's a change that I've made, that if someone of color says that it's about race, then, okay, that's it, it is about race. But the pipeline from high school to the prison system uh, really gets me. There's an excellent podcast series. It's about eight episodes. I just finished listening to Meg. It's called Caught. And it's all about the school to prison pipeline. And it was eye-opening for me to understand just the scope of that problem and all of the things that contribute to that, that part of the system of racism. I'll look it up. I think one thing that I've been reading with this chapter and with everything else that I've been reading and trying to digest was that we as as a society have a, a tendency to throw in a yeah but so someone comes at us and says this is you know this happened to me this was about race and we go yeah but what about this mm-hmm. and that's that's not okay like you're whatever you're feeling is real your feelings are just as valid as everybody else's feelings so whether the intention was to be about race or not if you feel that it is about race then it is and we need to stop adding that yeah, but excuse for someone that may have said something or done something really harmful. Dave, can you share what you put in the, sh- the chat? I really like that. And I want to make sure everybody hears that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the term, I think what you're describing, Jen, is white, what I call white splaining. You know, this immediate, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. This isn't about, you know, you're attacking me unnecessarily. This, you know, very defensive uh, reaction. And that's not listening. That's that's trying to make it about you. And that's in this book. And I think in a lot of the other books that people are reading about this, that it's that one of the central problems is when the, when people are brave enough to vocalize how they're being disenfranchised or marginalized, it's all justified and it's okay. And don't you, you're not, you're not looking at it the right way. Well, that's so disrespectful and, and unproductive. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think that point ties into what I found to be the most striking part of of chapter one, which is her analogy to being in an abusive relationship and the sort of gaslighting effect that that kind of white explaining has or that, well, you know, yeah, but, or this was just one instance or whatever other kinds of language get used instead of looking at racism as a systemic problem. So, but I found that that comparison to to being in an abusive relationship, except I think she uses the language of being in an rebu- uh, abusive relationship with an entire system and an entire culture. So, which having been in an abusive relationship with one person, I think, what would that feel like to have that compounded over and over and over again to live within that larger system as well? So, 
Yeah, I really like that analogy uh, too. And I thought it'd be really good for like students in a diversity class um, to read about too, um, because those small instances really do add up. And even if may- maybe it wasn't about race, it, it's still like that perspective and it's still in the picture and you just don't know if someone's treating you differently if it is or isn't about your race. And there's just no way to really know sometimes. And I'm saying that like as a person of color, you know, thinking, am I being mistreated? Did someone not hire me because of my name? Like, what is it? Um, You just will never know sometimes, but it doesn't make it like invalid that you're having that experience either. I like the, the illustration that directly follows that paragraph in the book as well, where she talks about people continually walking along and punching her in the arm. And, you know, then somebody accidentally elbows her as they're doing something else. And then that's the moment she she just explodes because people will not stop punching her in the arm. And it doesn't matter what the intent was with that last person that accidentally elbowed her. She still is existing in a system where she continually is being punched and has to deal with that. So it might not be, you know, an active, you know, instance where someone is trying to hurt her, but she still has to deal with that and the effects of that, no matter what the intention was. One, I think one other, um, kind of getting back to, to Kara's original question, the, you know, kind of point, the COVID-19, I think is something that, you know, we don't immediately, you know, race doesn't immediately come to the forefront. But I think about, I was just listening on the the radio the other day, they were talking about how, you know, Black and Latino people have higher rates. And, you know, so that information is presented. But, you know, as she says, you know, go beyond that and and ask, so, you know, why are are Blacks and Latinos disproportionately impacted by it? And, And they're looking at health outcomes and that sort of stuff. But I think also, too, you know, they brought up at one point that, you know, Latino people live, tend to live in smaller square footage in a larger household. And so again, so, so that maybe is a reason, but again, why do black and Latino people tend to live in, in smaller areas and have smaller amounts of square footage, you know? And, and, and so I think it, there is some, some racial element to it. I mean, the people that are being infected at a higher rate are people that you know, can't do what we're doing right now, just sit and have this conversation from, from an office, you know, they, they may have to work, you know, in these industries more than us. And so everything really does, you know, that, that's the whole thing. If it disproportionately impacts one group of people, then, then it is about race. Sarah, you, you touch on there, some of the economic issues that she highlights and she doesn't really go in super depth. Economics is a theme throughout the book, but she doesn't really get into as much as of redlining and and bank interest rate and some of the VA benefit issues that have affected those of color. And if you if you haven't read Tanahisi Coates, it's the article from The Atlantic and the title just ran out of my head. I will find it and I'll put it in the show notes, but it's an exceptional look at the economics of race throughout history. And if anybody remembers the title, help me, please. I like her approach to, to responding to the question, well, you know, isn't it all about class? Doesn't it have more to do with economic class? And the examples that she used in her, her hypothetical conversation with someone about, well, you know, given that all these other things are equal between people of different races from the same class, won't the outcomes continue to be impacted by race? I thought that was a, a really useful breakdown. Mm-hmm. And Josh rescued me. The article is The Case for Reparations by Tana Easy Coates. Thank you, Josh. And Julie, you've got a you put a quote in the chat. Would you share that? Because it's a it's a really good thought that I think I've fallen into many times. I can't remember where I read that, but it has just stayed with me. And I do share it with my students in the classroom. We're having difficult conversations. The idea that listening is hearing without belief. I think it may have been tied to a feminist theory course I took once. And the idea is when you're having a conversation with someone, set aside your own beliefs and try and hear theirs. And that's when you're really listening. If you're just hearing your own thoughts and skating across the surface of their words, then you're not really listening to them, you're trying to find your own entry point and defend your own point of view. So you just have to completely set your ego on the floor and walk away from it. 
and try and hear their perspective as deeply as you can. Listening to understand versus listening to respond. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's expand and add in chapter two here. Chapter two is entitled, What is Racism? And uh, this gets to our our, ner- our word nerds unite um, hashtag we've got going in the chat here. And I'm going to start this chapter on page 26. There's a, in the hardback version, there's a break in the chapter here. So it's pretty easy to find. It says, probably one of the most telling signs that we have problems talking about race in America is the fact that we can't even agree on what the definition of racism actually is. And I think this group will have a good discussion starting there, but going wherever we want to go. So I never thought about that before <laughs> until, until my conversations again with my in-laws. I'm really sorry for going back to that, but because I just assumed everyone knew what racism was. And then in the response to the whole Black Lives Matter conversation, someone in my family said to me, well, Polish lives matter and German lives matter. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with this conversation <laughs> because, you know, you're historically looking at this from your white view and you're thinking of white Polish people and white German people. And the fact that I even have to just explain to you what racism is, I was just blown away. So when I read this here, you know, her discussion of can we agree on what racism is, that to me was kind of profound because it's almost like let's agreeing on what the color blue is, you know, it just seems so obvious. And it's astonishing to me that it's not obvious to everyone. And Mandy, you added something in the chat from chapter one, but I think it really connects well to Becky's point. Do you mind saying that for the rest of the group? Sure. Thanks, Kara. I, I, one of the things that I was really struck by in chapter one, that I keep thinking about is the notion that race is a social construct, which it is. You know, we know that there's more sort of, there's more similarity biologically across racial groups than within racial groups. But at the same time, this is a huge component of the way in which our society works. And she says, she makes this point by saying, we could also make the argument, I think it's very true, that money is a social construct. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, why, the only reason that gold is valuable is because we all agree that gold is valuable. But regardless of whether or not it's a social construct, it's, it's hugely at play with regards to how our lives are shaped. And, you know, sort of the, the former sociologist and anthropologist in me just, just love that so much. And I think it really helps illuminate a lot of the arguments that we're making. You know, and I think, I think the notion of, you know, the, the all lives matter argument, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but <clears throat> I had a conversation with one of my students a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about an analogy that he shared or someone shared with him. It's, it's like, if you, if you go to the hospital with a broken rib, you know, and, and the doctor says, I, you know, it's great that you have a broken rib and I'm going to, I'm going to take a look at this, but let's, let's really focus on all your bones. Well, <laughs> Not all of my bones are broken. <laughs> you know, this isn't, you know, sure, Polish lives matter. We, no one is saying that they don't. But there, there are lives that are constantly under threat of sort of state-sanctioned erasure right now. Mm-hmm. And we really need to place the focus there. I mean, saying Black Lives Matter is not saying all lives don't matter. So, yeah, thanks, Kara, for indulging me there. Yeah. Becky, I too have some racist family members and and just thinking a little bit of how I was going to word it, I was going to say that they have old fashioned ideas and it just kind of reminded me that I was, I was white explaining that again, because it's not that they're old fashioned. You gotta, you gotta call a horse a horse and they, they do have racist ideas. And one of my mother's favorite phrases is I'm not racist, but... Oh. Mm-hmm. And inevitably, the next thing coming out of her mouth is going to be racist or homophobic or you know, just it's going to have some sort of negative connotation. And for a long time, I viewed that as 
old fashioned, but I felt like I knew what racism was. And I think defining racism and making sure that you're not just brushing the surface of it is really important in our day and age, because, you know, explaining it as, you know, something that creates inequality within races is one way to put it. But you also, when we start digging into these conversations and we're looking at, you know, economics and we're looking at education and all of those different pieces, it goes so much deeper. I just think it's really important to make sure that we're acknowledging that in in our time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the things I underlined in this chapter on page 29, when she compares it to cancer, Mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you're just fighting the symptoms of cancer instead of the whole cancerous system or whatever. And that totally made, I was like, oh my gosh, like little light bulb moment. I was like, this is so true. It's not really about trying to get my racist family member to love people of color. It's really the reason why he doesn't is because of the systemic racism. And maybe I need to put more of my energy into that than just these individuals. But really like how she talked about if you like want to call out like racism instead of just saying, hey, that was racist, just adding how that impacts the system on a systems Mm -hmm. level and how that's unhelpful. And I think uh, I thought, oh, wow, this is a very good, direct, objective way to interject like microaggressions in the classroom. Because sometimes as an instructor, I want to be fair. I want students to feel heard. But also like that's not okay. How can I reframe this and like kind of have a teaching moment of how like, you know, that was microaggression and how we can move forward and why it is from an objective standpoint. So I really liked that portion of the book. I really liked that portion too. I actually, I listened to it on audiobook. And as soon as I finished that, I hit pause and I texted my friend about it because I, what I really liked there was that she offered not just like a critique of how we talk, but she sort of offered a script for how to talk about it. The um, don't just say this behavior is racist, but add to it, or you can say this behavior is racist and should, but then add to it, also add to it. And it contributes X, Y, Z concrete harm that directly or primarily affects this group of people. And I liked that, that script you can say, you can point out that things are racist, but then tack to the end. And here's how it harms this, this group of people. And it leads to, you know, a culture of, I don't know, it leads to a, a business culture where we think that black people are lazy and that's why it's bad to say this thing, like point out directly. And I really liked that part. That was sort of a, it wasn't a light bulb moment, but it was sort of a, oh, that's how I can actually talk about it kind of moment. I agree. It it is a lot more helpful when we can refer back to systemic racism because th- this is the reason why it impacts black people or people of color in their health, their safety, their socioeconomic status, and these are the reasons why it just feels a lot more objective, less yeah. attacking their personal beliefs, which I think is helpful. So I, I would agree with that. I was also thinking like, this is a really good intervention for, I teach like a human services internship class at Purdue, but like, you know, when we're talking about clients and making these stereotypes, like they're always late to work, they're always doing these things, they're late to their sessions. Hey, wait a minute, where is this coming from? Let's look at this from a systems perspective. Are we, you know, we need to be checking into those biases uh, to make sure we're not contributing to it. And I think modeling that and as a supervisor teaching students who are going to be in the healthcare field is really important that we're integrating like those moments into our classroom too. Yeah, that seems to be really important. I know recently I've, I saw a couple of nurses that were put on blast because of some racist comments and stereotypes that they were making and were called out and Lutheran hospital dismissed. I know dismissed one of them and said, you know, we want everyone in Fort Wayne area to know that this nurse's values do not reflect our own because she was spouting on some pretty racist stereotypes. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else saw that, but it was... Yeah, I remember that one. The video was awful. It was just... just makes me think like, you know, where are they getting their training? And I think in a lot of training programs in the healthcare field, we want to give them direct skills. But diversity is such a big piece of that, that we need to make sure we're also giving them tools and like making sure they know that that's important too. Because I feel like diversity just kind of gets swept off. Like it doesn't matter. It's like 
the last thing on the list or just one chapter we cover. So I think as instructors, just being sure that we're doing that in the classroom, especially for, you know, professions where they're going to work in the field with communities. That's exact. My husband is a nurse. And when he watched that video Meg's talking about, he was like, where did she go to school? I can't believe she finished her program and graduated with that mindset to be a nurse, yeah. to help people. Yeah. And don't you think that speaks to this whole, it's part of this notion that we can train away racism, you know, that we can give them behaviors or have them follow these certain specific directions. But fundamentally, when somebody is angry and there's this emotional response, we default to fundamentally who we are. And I'm not even sure that you can reach inside and change that racism that's at the heart of their real world view and their sense of power in their lives. So I completely agree that there has to be more than just training. There has to be, this is just not okay. You can't work here and, and publish this in some way. And I don't care if it's on Facebook and it's your own personal, whatever, there's no argument for that. It's just fundamentally wrong. And I think it'll take a long time for us as a culture to shift to that. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, I just question to your point of where did she go to school? Well, I'm not even sure that you can educate away. Like I keep thinking of my in-laws. I don't think you can educate away that racism. Mm -hmm. My one brother-in-law is a really educated guy. He's actually a nurse. <laughs> I think sometimes the efforts are counterproductive because they increase people's defensiveness. Right. That's and so these kinds of conversations really have to somehow acknowledge those feelings as well in order to overcome them. Mm -hmm. it, it's the defensiveness I think is, is a big part of the, the issue. Right. Defensiveness is, is so tough and especially, you know, trying to lay in the groundwork and the foundation for the dialogue and for the conversation within the classroom. Often on the first day of class, I'll ask the students to look around and say, does anybody know anybody else? And maybe you get like one or two hands pop up but say, wait a second, we are a group of total strangers coming together to ask questions of life and society around us. We're going to have to find a way to build a foundation of how to communicate with each other. We all have different knowledge systems, different beliefs. Everybody's battling the echo chamber of, well, I, everything that I've been told is, is, is giving me this particular idea. And, I'm not racist, but this is this is ideas that uh, are so ingrained. And within these echo chambers of information, I feel like a lot of people have been trained to, oh, if somebody calls you a racist, here's how to respond to that. There's a kind of a built-in adversarial element to a lot of discussions. And if can get to the point of, let's stop and let's try to listen to the 20 other people in the classroom. Let's try to... And they have the students, well, what do you want to share about yourself? How do you want to share your identity and your worldview with the rest of the class? And the rest of us kind of kind of listen as, as they take the lead for that self-construction sharing for others. Todd, you put a comment in the chat. I'd like to give you the opportunity to build on that if you'd like. Todd has construction going on in the house, so I will, uh, I'll read it, that um, many white people don't even see that racism is or are systems of power. And that's a really, mm -hmm. that is a really important thought as we approach these conversations, particularly with our relatives and others who just, it's just what they bring to the conversation. And it's because they may not even believe that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Such a great conversation. Just to build off of that a little bit as well, as we're defining what racism is, I think that's important because what racism is has changed over the last couple hundred years of its history in the United States. And I'm just finishing up another book for a, a different group. Um, we were reading The New Jim Crow, and that's really good too. And it takes a, a pretty critical view of what you know, what racism looks like in these days and how that was different than, you know, how it looked under slavery or how it looked under new Jim or the Jim Crow laws of the South. And a lot of it is recognizing the different stages and rep responding to those stages specifically. In 2020, you know, uh, using blatantly racist language or, you know, seeing the icons of the, you know, slavery south or, you know, even lynchings or other things like that. 
no one disagrees at this point that those are racist symbols. But I think, you know, to Todd's point too, a lot of folks, predominantly white folks, I would say, don't recognize that racism, you know, in its current state is a lot of structural, you know, systems and not just those blatant calling folks different racist names at this point. She makes a good point on, I think, uh, page 29, that she says so much of what we think and feel about people of other races is dictated by our system and not our hearts. So as we're calling calling out the racist actions of the people around us, your family and people that you love, you know, it's, it's easy to get angry and target and say, you know, you're, that you're being awful and this is a hateful thing to do. But like you've been talking about, they don't know it doesn't come from a malintended part. It comes from a system that they're a part of and that they've been benefiting from. And so, you know, we were talking about finding ways to point out the system. You're not attacking the person that way. That's the, I feel like they're less likely to get defensive. You're saying this is a, something you're a part of and you didn't even know. That's a really good point about the system. I've been talking like with my graduate program and like people of like non-black people of color uh, groups. And we were talking about how like even minorities subscribe to this white system to try and get ahead and that there's this structure in place. And it's kind of even between minority groups, we're kind of pitted against each other to try and climb that white system and get ahead. And someone's got to be on bottom. And that's part of being the model minority, trying to get ahead. But this just reinforces this white system that's in place by doing that but we're all just so subscribed to this system that we have in this country it's really hard to walk away from that for most people yeah and before we can even walk away from it just seeing it which is how ideology works when you're within it you can't see it for what it what it is it's just the way the world is it's only when you're outside of a system that you can begin to see it and so I think part of the challenge is how do we living within the system that we live begin to see uh, that it is a system and then begin to to work on ways to change that? It's, it's a very hard thing to do. I think we could probably like one change that would make a pretty big impact is by acknowledging the system and then starting young by adding this these portions to our history books and our history books in our education because it's very neglected and not talked about. I know from my education experience, it's Christopher Columbus came over and he thought he was in India. He named everyone Indians and we're still calling Native Americans Indians. And these discussions need to be talked about. I have a 14 year old and he seems to be talking a lot more about race and disparities more so than I was ever aware of when I was his age. So I think it is happening more, but just even upping it a little bit and taking responsibility with our publishers and saying, you know what, we really need to talk more about the system. You know, how is racism a system? How this impacts where minorities are today in 2020? The English faculty at Ball State early in the Black Lives Matter um, movement this summer, they put out a statement about how they are going to, as a group, they're going to discuss, I think, this book and White Fragility, um, and they're going to take really concrete steps together as a group to decolonize their curriculum and to continue to try to make sure that it is it is not racist. And we've been talking about that some with the Vice Chancellors for Academic Affairs as well, but I hope as you're as you sit in your curriculum meetings, for those of you, I know many of you sit in those meetings, I hope you'll talk about that topic too. I hope that you'll start to, to bring that conversation in if you haven't already. I'm a, I'm a graduate student with, with Bell in English right now, getting for a PhD. And not only are they, I mean, it's a magnificent faculty, but just a quick plug for them, you know, anybody can follow them on, uh, follow that English department on, um, you know, all the social media platforms to, keep up with the books they're kind of suggesting or conversations they're trying to, you know, get students to have. And, and it's, it's actually, I mean, I think maybe, I don't mean to dismiss what we do here at Ivy Tech, but I think, I think the way they're marketing some of their classes uh, about these very, uh, you know, sensitive issues is, is also an interesting strategy to take because they're embracing, you know, the popularity of those platforms. And Steve, it's, I will add the links to their social media platforms and things in the show notes because that I, you're right. They, they do a wonderful job and I want to respect that. 
So let's keep running our conversation out here to add chapter three, which is what if I talk about race wrong? And I'm going to go to page 45 to start this chapter. And at the just before she talks about sort of how to do it, she reminds us, um, you're going to screw this up. You're going to screw this up royally more than once. Uh, so I think it's a good place to remind everybody that if you're going to have these conversations, they're going to go badly and that's okay. You got to keep trying. So what in uh, chapter three spoke to you? It's interesting right now because of the discussions about whether public schools should return on time uh, mm-hmm. next month. But the, the, on, on mine, it's 43. It's right before that, that where you point to on 45 maybe. But she, I didn't, I mean, this is just a little, it's a, in a way, it's like an un, maybe it's an unconscious microaggression, if that's a thing, to schedule these parent-teacher conferences during the day, which is, of course, the teacher's work day, the convenient for them, and either just being completely oblivious or almost unwilling. And that's not fair. But making it harder for the parents of the kids who or in that class, right? So so this is a great example of how our, or many people's everyday activities, it's when you just allow yourself to step back and see how it's perceived by others and try to examine the sort of ramifications or what it, what it looks like, the implications, then it's easier to maybe to understand why, why these feelings of, of being attacked through racism exists. Mm-hmm. That's one of the the ideas that I know, and Teresa and I have called to been co teachers together in Muncie, and we've talked about is the students' perception of parents, especially for those who are going into the education field. And there's this idea that if they're not there, they're not participating, they're not in the classroom, they don't care, they're lazy, and trying to so share. Well, have you thought about this? What if they're working a third shift job and, you know, this is their time when they're sleeping and they can't come? Or what if this is their work shift and it doesn't work for them? How do you work to make the parents a part of it and make them partners? And I've also kind of looked at that. I'm working on my dissertation as well at Ball State in adult community and higher ed. And I'm focusing it within that in early childhood education. And what are those barriers to family involvement and trying to have students and have the community take a look at this from a different perspective of not viewing parents and families and um, especially parents of color who want to be involved, but either don't know how, or we're not giving them the opportunity. Here, I was typing a comment in the chat, but I'll, I'll say it. I was a, a K-12 educator for uh, the early part of my career. And that was a belief I had. If the parents weren't in the classroom, they didn't care. And at the time, as a 22, 23 year old, I didn't, I had no concept that it was racist. I know it now. And it, I would approach it completely differently now. And I try to approach it dif- differently in my work at Ivy Tech, but absolutely had that belief early on in my career. So I love your approach to try to think about how we as, as educators break down those barriers now to give people the opportunity to be involved in a way that works for them. We've had a few folks share some things in the chat, like the uh, Tulsa massacre that a lot of us just learned about. Uh, the Watchmen show on HBO is a really interesting way to learn more about that in a, in a fictional way, and then to cause you to dive into it in a, in a nonfiction way, hopefully as well. I'm going to add in chapter four, just in the interest of time, and we'll kind of continue our conversation here. So chapter four um, is called, why am I always being told to check my privilege? And there is a interesting part on page 63 in my notes, where she talks about the threat of privilege. And this sort of brings our conversation full circle. And I apologize. I don't remember who started with this. I think it was Becky, that the concept of privilege violates everything we've been told about fairness and everything we've been told about the American dream of hard work paying off and good things happening to good people. And she goes on a little bit later in that paragraph to say the concept of privilege makes the world seem less safe. And I just, I thought that was a really good way to lay out privilege in a way that maybe reduces the threat of it a little bit. 
Well, to loop this back into chapter three, this is where my hard conversations get derailed. Trying to talk about privilege with my my family, it often shifts to there were times that I wasn't privileged. But having the challenge is to define that this isn't necessarily economic privilege. There's difference between your white privilege and your lack of economic privilege. Those are different things. And that's that's a hard thing for for folks to get their heads around, you know, my, as a real life example, my, my mom was raised by a single parent, you know, in the seventies. And so there was a lot of things that she didn't have. And she looks at her own life and sees that she was not privileged and she did work hard for what she has. And so when I can, you know, if we're trying to challenge that view that you have an innate privilege, it's, it's very hard for her to see that she has that because she knows what she fought for and did. And I, can't discard that either that's very real but you know trying to explain that your privilege is your privilege or lack of privilege is different because you're not black that's that's a hard barrier to break down she makes such a good point about privilege not lessening the amount of work that you did to get to a specific place and like like I'm in a point where I have I generally have economic privilege now in my life I can buy the things I need without too much stress and it doesn't mean I didn't work for it, but it was easier for me because my skin is white. Well, I mean, even for somebody like me at the end of this chapter, I literally listed all of my places of privilege, but at the bottom and looking at all of it, my, my main one has been access because I, I am, my father was an undocumented Mexican farm worker. I grew up in a foster home in Kentucky. So, you know, there, there, I did come to life with with a lot of disadvantages but at the same time none of those had to do with the color of my skin and i think one of the big things about race is that it's one of those few identity markers that whether you want to or not it, it's on full display all the time like the fact that i'm cisgendered isn't on display all the time or the fact that i had access to a good education system because the city that i happen to live in had a, had a strong, you know, I, I happen to live in a good neighborhood that had a strong tax base so that I could go to those schools. That, that stuff is not immediately apparent, but your race is for the most part. And, and I think it's hard for people who have these hidden privileges to, to really be able to see how even the fact that they're hidden is a privilege. I think someone brought it up earlier, but like the the whole privilege and how it intersects with like class and like maybe being low social class or having a low SES status. I, I think it can be really hard to like come around and like acknowledge the difference between, you know, racism and not having privilege and you have some privileges and not others. So I, yeah, I think this is where the conversation sometimes gets murky in like helping, like when I'm thinking about teaching a diversity in class and like helping teach students around that um, and what it means to have privilege too. I do want to say that one thing that I thought was really cool was it was on page 65, I think, where she is talking about how, you know, because as soon as I read that, you know, the title of the chapter, Check by Privilege, like, I mean, I, I immediately had an idea of what that meant and what she was talking about. But she also, she just sees it in such a holistic way where she talks about how, you know, knowing your privilege is also the way where you can view your own self within that power structure. Mm -hmm. And that really allows you the ability to, to create change. Because if you know where your privilege is, then, then you can start to, to make those changes where, where you can. And I think that, that that helps particularly if you feel like that you don't have a lot of power or, you know, mm -hmm. as an academic advisor, I might not have the same power that the provost does. But at the same time, I, I do know where, you know, I do have some privileges in, you know, my work and, and what I do and, and how can I, how I can affect those changes within the system. I love that point, Sarah. That's a note I wrote for myself at the bottom of the chapter was how can I use this for good? I feel like I'm turning this into Spider-Man, right? Like I need to use my power for good and not evil. But how can I take what I have been given and flip it around? You know, if, I, if I'm in a position to recognize that I have those advantages, where can I be more beneficial to the world? Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that I had highlighted to the, the paragraph is when we're willing to check our privilege, we're not only identifying areas where we are perpetuating oppression in order to stop personally perpetuating that oppression, 
but we're also identifying areas where we have the power and access to change the system as a whole. And I think those are we're starting to get to some of the takeaways that I was really hoping to get out of the, the book and out of these discussions is, you know, I have started really reflecting on some of the areas where I do have privilege. And now I'm really wanting to know how I can use that privilege and empower other voices or, you know, help change um, things for the better. I don't know if this will apply to anyone, but one thing, and this is admittedly very embarrassing to admit, one thing this book, uh, this chapter, excuse me, made me remember is how, I'm not going to waste your time with the exact specifics, but I've basically been accused of a crime I didn't commit at ages like eight and 13. And I still remember them. I'm not going to reveal my age, but a lot longer in life. I remember those two events. And it, what this, what I bring that up, I bring that up because it made me realize that those were, those were jarring events for me. Those were damning like staples of my childhood. Like that, like how I felt being accused of something I know I didn't do and having a feeling powerless to, to defend myself. And then obviously what I realize is that there are people who have had that regularly. It is, it is literally part of their life. It is, I think it's in that, is it the hate you give movie where the parents are teaching the children what to do when, the, if they're pulled over or something, I, I watched the part of the movie, read the book. Anyway, the whole point is like, that's, that's become a, a part of their childhood, a regular part of their childhood. And it, it really opened my eyes to what, Truly, why I hearing Steve talk that about his childhood reminded me that when I was eight, my grandfather accused me of cheating at cards, and it was deeply upsetting to me. And it's still probably of all the memories I have of my grandfather, that single memory is the most vivid. And imagine a whole lifetime of being misperceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Steve. Yeah. And Amani um, reminded us movie in the book, which is also excellent, Just Mercy, which is truly the worst situation of where that happens to us in this country. All right. I will go ahead and draw the conversation to a close for today. Thank you all so much for spending the morning with me. And I know I'll see most of you, um, if not all of you again, in a, another conversation here in a week or so. Um, so keep reading if you're not done yet. And uh, we'll talk to you. talk to you soon. Thank you again for joining in on this episode of Our College of Voices. I want to again thank the members of today's panel. I won't list them all for you, but it takes a tremendous amount of bravery to have a conversation like this. So thank you again to everyone who was on the show. As you know, every one of our episodes ends with a call to action. And if you heard something in today's episode that made you a bit uncomfortable, I just ask you to find a colleague that you trust and have a conversation with them about it. Again, conversation is the first step. We have to move to action, but at least start the conversation. Thanks again for listening. I'm your host, Kira Monroe. You can connect with me on Twitter at KNM Tweets. You can reach us by email at our college or voices at ivytech.edu. Leave us a voicemail at 317-572-5049. Don't forget, if you're an Ivy Tech faculty or staff member, you can always join our Microsoft Teams listener community. Our website is ivytech.edu forward slash podcast. Production assistance for this and every episode provided by Becky Campbell, Sarah Ferguson, and the Ivy Tech Community College marketing team. Our podcast concept is by Matthew Pittman. Theme music and post-production services provided by Jen Eads at the Brassy Broadcasting Company. We'll talk to you next time on Our College, Your Voices.